Okay, I think we're being recorded right now. Um, so thanks everyone so much for showing up to this uh, organizing workshops mentoring session. I'm really excited to meet all of you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this works. I haven't actually done this. So let's see. Ooh, all right. I have a lot of things up. Okay. So does that work for folks? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is the, oop, the slide deck that yeah. I have. Um, we're going to just talk through some of the slides, but I think we also have an etherpad. So um, if we discuss, we can just throw it in here. Um, I think this would be a pretty straightforward conversation um, since there aren't too many of us. Um, but essentially for today, I figured I would talk a little bit about um, first we do intros and uh, talk about the code of conduct um, and then just sort of launch into a discussion on resources that are available to self-organize workshops and then also maybe some challenges or some difficult things that you might run into. Um, and I also wanted to recap some of the mistakes that I have made in organizing workshops um, because I think, you know, from those mistakes you can learn. Um, and then also um, just like some things that you might want to think about that you don't know going in. Um, and then finally, I think, uh, you know, we have a few more chats scheduled for this and then also any questions that you have, um, we can like ask throughout or at the end. Um, so yeah, um, with that, I guess we can go ahead and um, I'll briefly say that this whole thing, you know, falls under the Carpentry's Code of Conduct. Um, it's really a great, uh, Thing that all of Carpentries falls under. So um, I think you've probably seen this multiple times. If you've done, if you've been to a workshop or any type of training, um, you've probably seen this. So um, if you want to read more, there's like a link here for a detailed description of the COC. Um, but essentially use welcoming and inclusive language. Please let me know if there's something that I say that you're like, hey, like that's not within the code of conduct, make sure, um, you know, it falls so, um, Yeah. I guess we can just go ahead and do some intros. So um, why not, I was gonna call on people in the chat. Um, so maybe what's your affiliation? What's your background with Carpentries? And then what are you interested in self-organizing? Um, or what's your objective or end goal with this? Um, so I guess who is um, on my screen first? Um, Jessica, do you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, ooh, now where's the, oh yeah. So I'm Jessica Trelogan. I am with the University of Texas in Austin and I work at the libraries there. Um, and sorry, what else is on this list? I'm basically, I've been a data carpentries instructor for a few years, um, and, but I haven't ever done a workshop or taught in an actual one. I've attended several and I've done um, a lot of sort of not Carpentries officially um, sort of modules in another workshop series that I do. Um, so I, I've taught little bits and pieces of the modules but I've never done a full-on um, organized workshop. I'm about to do one in, at the end of August sort of the 22nd and 23rd, a self-organizing one. And I'm doing it with a partner from, um, from the University of Texas. And we have it pretty well organized for now, I think, um, but have been having a lot of challenges around the logistics and decisions about whether to charge and how to charge and how to do the catering and all of the all the annoying logistics things. Um, and I would love to have advice on any of that, as well as on sort of building community within the university. Um, Cause I'd like to do a lot more of the self-organized workshops and pull together instructors and helpers. Um, so any kind of advice and um, suggestions around building that community would be great. Great, I think I might have actually met someone from your institution at a recent community call. Oh, I cool. Her name. Uh, but I'm pretty sure she was saying that she was going oh. to do a workshop in a few weeks. Yeah. Was it Emily Beagle? Yes, it was. I think it yeah. was. I think she was on a community chat. Yeah, so. she, she's going to be one of the instructors in our in our workshop. Fantastic. Um, cool. So I guess is Dennis here? 
Okay, um, Lactasia? I, I think I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not really, but anyway, I'm, I'm so used to people pronouncing it wrong that um, it really doesn't matter. So I'm happy with however you pronounce. Um, <laughs> however, uh, my name is Lactasia um, Mosuko. I'm um, in South Africa I'm working for the National Cancer Registry. Um, I have been involved with the carpentry since 2017. I have taught at a number of workshops, uh, um, just to name a few, in Ethiopia, in University of Venda, and uh, University of Verde. However, I haven't done any self-organized workshop. So from here, I would like to uh, learn some of the tools that um, I'll be using to organize the workshop myself. And um, yeah, so that's the main aim why I'm here. Great. I think we will go over some tools. So uh, looking forward to talking about that. Um, Evo? Sorry for mangling these names. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Um, yeah. yeah. So my name is Ivo Are. Um, um, I'm part of the Carpentries for South Africa or Africa. And uh, I recently moved to uh, Memorial University in Canada. So I'm involved with the Carpentries both in South Africa and in Canada. Um, I've taught in a couple of workshops. Uh, I always get involved at the stage of just that are teaching or helping. And uh, I've never really done that whole process of, of you know, um, organizing a workshop or even a self-organized um, workshop. So um, I thought it would be a good thing for me to be here and, and, and then all that process all together. So um, um, I'm in a similar um, boat with Aptasia, as she said. Um, so happy to meet you guys again. Great, and I think we have someone who just signed up, Moses. Uh, it's good evening from here. Actually, it's about 11, it's about 10 p.m. plus in South Africa. Yeah. I, <laughs> I am Moses Obeko. Uh, I'm a lecturer with uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal in the Department of Genetics. Uh, I got introduced to the carpentry uh, earlier this year. I have attended the instructor's training and uh, I'm hopefully going to be doing my last checkout, my video checkout in two days time. And in my, in, in my stay, short stay in the carpentry, I have assisted in one major workshop hosted here in Kwazulu Natal, carpentry training director. And I was assigned the hosting of the genomics uh, carpentry. After my qualification, I hope that uh, I'll be able to do that by myself. But right now, I, I am looking for certified carpenters to assist with the hosting. And I felt that whether I am doing it directly myself or with colleagues, uh, I should be acquainted with the basic rules so as not to as not to miss fire. That's why I'm here tonight. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the big South Africa cohort here. I've always heard so many great things coming out of um, your community, and it's great to meet finally meet some of you in person. Although it's it's pretty late there, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, okay, great. Um, I guess about me, um, I don't know if I want to write down what my my affiliation and everything is. But I'm at the University of Chicago, um, and my background with the carpentries is I actually think I've been um, officially an instructor probably for less time than most of you. Um, I got certified officially this fall, but I've been teaching um, a little bit before then. Um, so 
um, as part of my job, I work with researchers in the social sciences. Um, I'm sort of an embedded data person in our research center, um, and I help them sort of gain uh, software and computing skills. So um, it's sort of part of my job to run workshops and, and uh, bring people up to a basic level of like computing literacy. Um, so the carpentries are a really good fit for me. Um, and so I'd already been organizing workshops um, before I even did the carpentries. And so what had actually, what actually ended up happening was I just sort of took those skills that I'd built up in that place and just, I was like, okay, I'll just organize some carpentry workshops now. And so um, we got two organized in the spring, um, planning another for the fall. Um, and this is something that um, basically it was just me and my research center and saying like, I want to do this and um, getting a space and, and figuring it out. Um, so for me, it was it was sort of like um, I saw a gap for my researchers, and I wanted to sort of fill that. And I was like, I can I can organize something, um, and it turned out to be a bit more work than expected, um, but it it worked well. Also, um, did someone just join us? Did Matthew just join us? Mm -hmm. Would you like to introduce yourself? It's Matthew from the Office of Consumer in South Africa. Um, genetics department. Um, I got introduced to carpentry uh, November last year. We are attending training on R. Um, then early this year, I was part of a doctor training. And uh, subsequently after that, I was able to complete all my checkouts. Um, then I also assisted in one of the uh, workshops that was uh, held, I think, a couple of months ago. Um, I'm here to increase my um, proficiency in coding and uh, also to assist in any future um, genomics workshop that will be organized uh, here in UPCD and also to apply some of the skills in my research. Great. All right. Um, so with that, I think you can jump into sort of talking a little bit about the process of organizing workshop. Um, I think organizing is um, seems pretty daunting. So I wanted to break it down into some um, basic steps and then uh, give a few resources that I found pretty helpful in, in organizing. Um, so um, just giving an overview of what I see as a general workflow of organizing events. Um, I think it's this basically a seven step process. First, um, getting institutional buy-in um, slash recruiting your co-instructors. So getting buy-in from um, the organization you're with and then also um, finding someone else or some other people to support your efforts teaching. Um, once you have that, you know, finding the space and the date, um, then setting up the tech infrastructure um, like a workshop website or event by event, um, publicizing it and sharing it out. Um, five, coordinating the logistics, um, what's like food, Wi-Fi, emails with people, you know, getting helpers. Um, six, the easy part, teaching it. Um, and seven, doing any follow-up activities that okay. you do. So recruiting, whether that's recruiting your helpers to become carpentry instructors or scheduling debriefs, um, writing a blog post. So I think today we're going to try to focus on the first five things um, because this is really sort of the organizing part of organizing workshops. Um, if you're interested in the teaching, I think there's a different mentoring group sort of focused on that. Um, and all of you, I assume, are actually great teachers at this point. Um, expertise. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about that part. Um, and then in terms of the follow-ups, I think that's, those are nice to have, but um, when you're thinking about planning a workshop, you know, the first five things are things that you really want to focus on. Um, so um, with that, are there any questions so far about sort of my vision of what we can cover? No, that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, so I guess um, the first thing that I wanted to um, discuss were just resources available for self-organizing workshops. Um, so the first, um, like I think just getting information about how to do this, um, I found pretty helpful. And so for me, um, I sort of dug through some of the Carpentries resources and um, you know ended up trying to find as much information as I could before I did it myself. I still think it's a little bit 
um, incomplete. Like, I don't think everything that you need to think about is in there. Um, but there's this blog post from 2016 um, that is pretty good. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and go to it. Um, it's just called Resources for Running Workshops. Um, so they have checklists essentially for instructors, hosts, and like self-organized workshops, email templates for your communications with students and co-instructors and helpers and learners, um, an accessibility checklist, a list of necessary equipment, and then a troubleshooting page. Um, for me, having that checklist was a really good starting off point. Um, so I think you will probably be doing host slash lead instructors of self-organized workshops. I'm just going to click on that as well. Um, and the way that this is structured in the documentation is that this, the host checklist is one thing. Um, this is essentially, if you were to do a um, uh, sort of centrally organized one, this is taken care of for you, but this is something that you should think about as an organizer and it's a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then some of this stuff as well, but you also have to combine that with the instructor checklist. Um, so not only are you doing sort of some of the instructor work, you're also doing a bit of the, you know, um, setup and workshop requests and recruiting helpers and advertising and all that stuff. Um, so I think that's a really good checklist to start off with. Um, I sort of found that it wasn't quite, it didn't quite take into everything that I needed to think about. So I actually made a personal checklist that you're, feel free to use this one um, or use it to organize your efforts. Um, I broke it down into sort of like groups. So um, in sort of the timeline that you need to do them. So um, definitely feel free to use this. Um, for me, like, I think like setting up, you know, the website, registering the event, recruiting a teacher. And then um, for me, like recruiting, you can recruit a co-teacher that is not a carpentry instructor. But um, for me, that's what I did. I just fast tracked them for instructor training. I was just like, hey, like, go, go, go apply and, and, and do that. Um, and then like the rest of this was sort of for my research center. I didn't have um, the privilege of sort of having a department administrator. My research center is super lightweight right now. Um, we're still, you know, pretty um, small. So I had to sort of like do some of this stuff myself. Um, but I think um, if your department has an administrator, like they can help with the, you know, flyers and the emails and like the news stories and the blog posts. <laughs> the teaching part is the shortest because I, I didn't really keep track of the teaching in here. Um, so these are just like the tasks. Um, and then logistics, um, I found that I had to do a lot of this myself um, as I didn't have that much support, but if you have a department administrator um, and you have someone dedicated in your department who like knows how to do these things, this the logistics part is the stuff that you really want to sort of delegate out. Um, because as a teacher, you wanna focus on your curriculum and sort of what you're teaching as much of the logistics, like the food, the Wi-Fi, you know, like printing various materials that you can, to, as much as you can delegate, try to do that. Um, and so I had um, my research director was really excited about the workshop and she actually just zoomed around and made coffee for everyone. And, you know, I didn't have to do that the day of myself, um, which was really nice. Um, and then I also have some things in follow up. Um, so those are a few checklists that you can use to start off with. Um, I think coming up with your own is often a good idea um, because you're, you know, you, you might have a different structure in your department. Um, and then um, uh, I set up uh, an, invite, an Eventbrite account for my research center. Um, and your department or institution may already have a way to register participants. Um, so look into that. Otherwise, if you need to set up an Eventbrite account, um, I think this is an example of what an Eventbrite event looks like. Um, so I'm going to click on this. And so this is a past event. It was a one day, essentially, R for Social Scientists workshop. Let's see if we can get there. Um, here we go. Um, and so I made a little graphic and then, you know, just put a blurb in. Um, and so this is, you can take a look. We had a location for it. Um, we did ours nine to four. Um, because it wasn't quite as long. Um, and then some topics and then your audience. Um, can, I quick ask, can I quickly ask, um, Angela, is the fee to pay for, I mean, to open an account with uh, Eventbrite? 
It's free to open an account with Eventbrite. Um, the way they make money, I think, is uh, taking a percentage off of your registration fees. Um, so that's something that I think you can run through Eventbrite. Um, personally, we actually didn't want to deal with the bureaucratic hassle of having people pay. Um, so we did ours for free. For that, um, you're sort of trading off. If you have it for free, you're going to have a lot more people not show up. Um, then if you get people to pay and then you also have um, higher attendance and probably um, uh, more resources to draw from. Um, you can do it through Eventbrite. I think if you have someone who knows how to do the financials, I can't speak to the financials at every institution. It's really different. Um, but you probably have some sort of department administrator who can handle that. Um, for us, my research director was like, we're not going to worry about um, sort of collecting money for now because there's just a lot of bureaucratic overhead that goes into collecting money. Um, so essentially what I did was uh, double the amount of people that, so for the registration, I made, I think our space fits 30 people. I made 45 slots. Um, and then I think like 35, uh, 25 to 35 people showed up um, on the day of. So um, if you're going to do a free workshop, um, I would say that half to two thirds of people show up um, and that's pretty normal. Do you find, Angela, that the, the caliber of students or like the, the committedness of the students that do come is, have you done one that is not free to compare? Um, I have not done one that's not free. So I guess I'm, that's something that I should actually ask someone else about. <laughs> so um, we haven't, piloted it yet. We might be doing so this year. Um, we found that if you don't pay for things, and this is actually something that I wanted to mention. So those are the resources. Um, mistakes I've made in organizing workshops. Um, I just wanted to cover some of these. One thing we found was if they're not, um, if they're not paid, uh, scheduling is really valued, like really important because the attrition rate really sort of goes with the academic calendar um, because people didn't pay for it. They're like, I have to study, like I have to, these are especially for undergrads and maybe some grad students um, like in the, our master's programs. Um, so I scheduled one of my workshops two weeks before finals. We had a huge drop off in terms of students. Um, so that was something that um, the earlier workshop was really early in our academic um, calendar and so I think the drop-off rate was a little less. Um, are there any other questions in terms of sort of the timeline or the yeah uh, yeah go ahead. I'm interested in that um, the scheduling timeline just following up from that comment and if you found that um, doing like a two-day workshop during the academic calendar is a is a problem or do you try to schedule them during breaks, during weekends? Yeah, I think it really depends on who your audience is. Um, do you have a sense of who you'll be teaching? I'm guessing it's going to be mostly graduate students. Yeah, I think graduate students have a bit more flexibility. Um, for us, at least the doctoral students, you know, um, many of them don't have to take classes after a certain amount of time. Um, so uh, that isn't so bad. I do think earlier in the um, year or you know even over breaks I think is better for people. Um, I've helped out with one bio um, workshop and I think we did the that like two weeks after school started and we got a pretty good turnout there. Um, I think the two day is uh, good. Um, for the bio one I did we did it over a weekend um, so people could we could get the space for that whole time um, and I think um, for the during the school week ones, I've just done one day workshops mainly mm -hmm. because um, it's a big commitment. Yeah, exactly. People's schedules sort of vary. I, I think it really has to do with who you want to, um, who you think is coming, and who you want to bring in um, to the community. Yeah, I think it's more customary to like do a two day workshop because that that is the format of um, the carpentries. But for us, it made more sense space wise to do a one day one. Um, and then do a one like a few weeks later. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I could just add that for, I mean, my experience, we've had to tailor it to the audience that we had. For example, we, in the previous workshop, we had most people from the government coming, the government department coming, and so there was not a problem in organizing a workshop in the middle of a, um, a school break. And then, you know, if the audience is, is, is more of the students, then we try to get them probably do a two day and, you know, schedule them in between. Say, for example, we'll start in the afternoon and some days we start in the morning and, and make it two day and probably the third day optional for those who want to, you know, to still follow. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, anyone else have anything to add about scheduling? Uh, I want to add that in my experience, I would say that the environment actually did decide a lot. I know in the US, you say there's no free lunch. And so <laughs> someone somewhere ought to be paying for everything. But in Africa, when there is free lunch, you get uh, a couple of more attendees than you scheduled for. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes when when the, there is a, a tea break and there's going to be a lunch session and it's free, and I think that's basically should work anywhere in the world. The, the, those who are interested might just not be interested because of your what they think they will be will be the take home, but access to a little meal. But in the end you find out that if you have scheduled, uh, if you have done uh, an advertisement and you, you record, you make people to register, whether they, you're paying or not, you, 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 you cap it, you cap your attendees based on uh, the qualifications they've gotten or by asked towards what you'll be teaching. At the end, whether they fit in of you or not, they still get something to go home with. And when you do a survey at the end of the program, you'll be surprised that you really made impact. So that's what I have observed in the few uh, meeting sessions that I have assisted with. I think that worked for us. I don't know what really will work with, for you in the US, but it works this way. That's a great point. I think, um, yeah, we, we definitely provide free food at all of our events. Um, I've been to, I've also helped out at a workshop where um, people sort of were on their own for lunch, um, which meant that we had to make sure that we actually gave everyone like an hour because you had to go out and get your food. One, one nice thing about having the food there is, you know, people just stay around. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that you can sort of stick more. Um, to your schedule. I think, for example, I remember uh, having people go out and get their lunches and then we had to start 15 minutes later because someone like got stuck in traffic or something. So um, <laughs> it was like, okay. All right, um, I'm gonna talk through a few mistakes that I've made. Um, oh, one thing to mention is um, these are resources and checklists available for self-organizing workshops. I don't think they're completely complete. Um, for example, there isn't a discussion of, you know, when do you charge, when do you not charge? Um, you know, do you do a one day or two day workshop? Um, and I think that those might be gaps in the resources and um, something to consider while you're organizing is how to contribute back to help other people self-organize. Um, maybe that's, we put together like a discussion thread on the GitHub or something about things. Um, but like keeping that in mind that when you organize, your experiences can also be taken to help other people organize. So um, just something to keep in mind. Um, I think I'm just gonna talk briefly about the mistakes that I've made in organizing workshops, just to touch on some things that you might want to avoid. Um, one, the first thing I mentioned was scheduling my workshop two weeks from finals. Um, when you, uh, if you have students at your workshops, um, that's something that you want to keep in mind. If you have professionals, you probably don't want to schedule at a time when professionals have to, you know, can't make it. Um, one thing that I've also done is forgetting to set up Wi-Fi ahead of time. Um, I assume that most people at my university can use 
um, the institutional Wi-Fi. However, we had people from outside the university actually come in. Um, and so if that's something that you open up to a non-university audience, um, making sure that they can access the Wi-Fi um, is really important. So um, that's one sort of institutional thing that you should think about. Um, and with that, I wanna go back to actually the required materials and equipment. So um, in the workshop checklist, there's something here with required materials and equipment. This is a really good list. Um, and you want to give this to your department administrator or whoever is coordinating things um, because it gives you like a whole list of what you need. Um, equipment and materials. And these are things that you like don't think about, um, but they've like um, written them all out. You know, power strips. We know we need sticky notes. You might not remember that you need name tags, pens and papers, signing sheets, you know, whiteboards. Um, and I think the Wi-Fi thing is actually in here. Um, so um, when you choose your venue, um, you want like take a look at this before you start finding places to do it. You know, um, so. For us, a really good space was in our research center. We have sort of a co-working room with many tables that you can move around. Um, there are power outlets everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, there are projectors like on three sides. So um, we could set up the room as much as we want. Um, and so that was really valuable for us. So definitely be aware that this checklist exists so that you don't have to be like, what else are we forgetting? What else like um, do we need? Um, and then finally, um, accessibility. Um, you want to make sure that whoever is interested in your workshop can attend. Um, and I think this is a main part of most carpentry's workshops that um, they're accessible via elevator. Um, and I actually have taught in places where there's no microphone, um, but I just, um, it's a smaller room. Um, but uh, checking the screen brightness is actually worthwhile and worth doing um, because that we've had complaints where people are like, yeah, I'm in the back and it's like the contrast is not very good. So um, sort of these auxiliary things that you wanna consider. Okay, um, let's see. <laughs> um, three is actually ordering food for the number of people who showed up or signed up because that number for me ended up being sort of half or you know, uh, the number of people who um, showed up. So um, attendance is, I think, I've gotten to a rule of thumb of half to two thirds of people who sign up will show up if you do it for free. Um, I think attendance is almost perfect if you get um, paid. Um, so you can sort of count on that. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to coordinate logistics by myself and not getting enough support. Organizing a workshop is a full-time job for some people. Um, so organizing it itself requires a lot of brain power. Um, and the more people you can get to delegate out that um, it's, it's better because you'll actually be teaching. So um, you want to be able to focus on that experience for your learners. Um, so if you can get people to help you with logistics, that is great. Um, and let's see, um, this, these, and then the last two are sort of less important, but still worth thinking about. Um, I planned a curriculum uh, and I ended up teaching about around what my boss thought would be useful for students and departments. Oh, here we go. Ah, getting a little stuck. Um, but that wasn't necessarily what students themselves needed um, or the audience. It's sort of hard to tell if you're doing it for the first time what people really need. Um, but um, I had heard from people in my prior office hours and sessions, oh my gosh, um, that they wanted X, Y, Z. My boss was like, no, we should fund, you know, this other workshop. Um, and it actually ended up being maybe not the right thing. So um, that was something that in a later workshop, we, we focused on what students had actually asked for, and that was a little bit better. And then finally, um, in terms of reporting, if you have to report your workshops, um, collecting data on your participants, whether that's, I think, through the registration is a really good thing to do. Um, so when you set up the event, right, including two or three questions about, are you, you know, what, what department are you from, or um, check this box if you are, you know, with the undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, research staff um, is useful. Um, the pre and post workshop surveys are fine. Um, I found that some of the data that we care about, for example, how many people are from our department at the workshop is not included in that pre and post workshop survey. Um, so if there is data that you think is gonna be important and that you need to report, um, thinking about incorporating that from the start in your registration is a really good idea. All right, so those are all my mistakes. Um, I think there are probably more that I haven't listed. Um, 
but um, I was going to ask, have you made any of these mistakes or are there any other things that you might run into um, in organizing? Um, hi, Angela. Uh, just before um, anybody answer that question, I've got um, a question as well to say, what is the recommended time that uh, you think somebody should budget in order to do the planning for the workshop? Yeah, and I think Jessica asked me this question and I didn't answer it, <laughs> so um, it's good. I think for me, um, starting the planning, uh, so we have a space that I can pretty easily get. Um, so starting the planning three to, two to three months out was fine for me um, in terms of advertising. The workshops go like hotcakes, um, which is an American phrase, but um, essentially they're really popular. So it's not hard getting people to sign up for them. Um, in terms of if you want to get institutional buy-in and um, thank you whoever's taking the notes. <laughs> um, so uh, institutional buy-in and uh, recruiting a co-instructor, I think like um, at minimum like three months out um, if possible. Um, and then the rest of it you can sort of fit in. Um, yeah, I think the three months before time span has been pretty good for me. Um, have other people had experiences? How, how early did you start planning or helping? That's been about what we did for this one that we haven't conducted yet. Um, and it has, I, I'm really glad we started that early because it's been a, it's just been a lot more work than we anticipated to get everything set up. We made the mistake, I think, of charging. <laughs> um, and it's a huge headache. But we wanted to avoid the food waste. Right, yeah, I think, I think there are sort of trade-offs there. Um, and, and actually charging makes it um, more sustainable, I think, in the future, um, because you don't need to tap into resources as much. But yeah, I think if you do charge um, putting in some time to figure out the funding and how that's going to work is really important. And, and coming up with the sweet, sweet spot of what you charge in order for all the percentages to be possible to take off the top because all of the systems skim some kind of amount. Yeah, I know at the University of Florida, I think they charge something like almost 30 to $40 for a workshop, um, which I think covers the food for them. Um, we were actually going to charge as little as like $5, which given the little amount of money that would have made us and the amount of bureaucratic overhead, like, <laughs> we decided just nothing at all. Um, how much are you charging? Jessica? We decided to go with $25 just to just a little bit better than breaking even off of that, all that work. Um, and we did it, wanted to do it as an experiment to see if it, just if it's worth it. Um, and I think once we get the system in place and figure out how to do it, it may be worth it for future events, but we're going to see. Yeah, I think um, setting up a workshop for the first time is actually pretty difficult. Like it's a high activation energy. It's, um, <laughs> there's a lot to think about. And then once you've done it once, it's like, okay, we can just keep going. Um, the first one, I felt like I just put in hours of time, which is why I encourage you to recruit a really big like team and delegate, yeah. which I am bad at delegating tasks. So um, I sort of was like, I'll do it all myself. And I'm like, oh my goodness. This much. Um, so I think like one of the mistakes that I would have listed that I made is actually not yet, not de delegating in, in sort of like all facets. So. Any other questions before? Mm. I guess I had one more question about the team. I don't um, have any questions. Oh. oh, Matthew, did you have something? Okay, yeah. I I'm just saying that um, charging for organizing a workshop like this. I'm just thinking that uh, looking at the importance of skills that need to be transferred to people, will it not be much more appropriate to fund a source, uh, to fund such uh, workshops? So to increase the particip participation of people? Um, yeah, so um, I, my job itself, um, 
is essentially a training job. So part of my work is to train people. So essentially I am being paid to do things like trainings. Um, I think in the case where you have volunteer instructors and it's not part of your core work, it does make maybe more sense to charge. Um, for me, it's, you know, it doesn't affect me and um, I mainly just get the resources from my center, but um, I think that's a good point. Right? Your, are you saying that um, the value of the skills that you share are worth the money? Mm. Was that the point you were making, Matthew? No, I'm just saying that, um, yeah, it was the money, but um, but then I'm just thinking that uh, we may have more participation if it has no cost. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it does make it more accessible to um, maybe people who don't want to pay, you know, uh, twenty five dollars. We have a lot of like grad students and a few undergrads sometimes. So, um, yeah, making it so so that's another. Actually, that that could be an interesting discussion. You know, do you charge or do you not? And I believe there was actually a blog post on this um, on the Carpentries website um, about charging. It's been a huge d question for for us in our first one, because right. if we decided to do food, we were really worried about no shows and wasting food for people who don't come. Right. So I guess that is the main a, a big question that. Um, well, well, that I think what what was uh, done in for the first workshop I attended was that in the um, before the workshop, it was mentioned that maybe three days before the kickoff of the workshop, if you don't attend, so you pay certain fine. Oh. All right. So there is a blog post on the Carpentries um, blog about workshop participant fees that I think is really good. Um, and there are various, I think, um, yeah. so I will put this in the etherpad. Um, I think this is a really good thing to bring up in um, organizing workshops. So do you charge? I'm just going to throw it into the Etherpad under that. Oh, that's not what I want. Um, it's on the Carpentries blog. Um, and I think a few instructors have mentioned sort of why or why not they charge. Um, and it really it has to do with your institution and sort of the funding that's available to you. So um, I think, yeah, covering costs is really valuable. Um, so they charge, I think University of Illinois does $40 for participants. Um, this is what I've run into administrative challenges. Um, so a fee is more the hassle for us. I'm on this side of the um, spectrum. Um, but in terms of attendance, again, people are more likely to show up if they pay um, accessibility amount and some conclusions. So this is actually something that if you all organize, um, I think definitely get back to me about or anything because I'm curious to see sort of um, it, it would actually be really interesting to get a survey out to this carpentries community about charging for workshops. If I would so. be really interested to hear about that. Yeah, that's ooh, all right. Ooh, sorry about my Slack notifications. Um, that's something that I think is a really good outcome. Actually. So I want to write that down and see if they can get a survey about um, self-organized stuff. So, okay. Yeah, I would like that. Yeah. Great. Um, what other, you know, difficulties have you all run into in, in sort of thinking about organizing or just putting it together for the first time? We had some debate about um, how many instructors would be too many. Um, we're kind of trying to build partnerships and um, community. And so I wanted to give uh, uh, several new, brand new instructors an opportunity to teach. Um, but we had some debate about how hard that, how, that, how it's harder on learners to switch between, say, four instructors in a workshop than it would be between two. I was curious if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think in deciding the number of instructors, um, for us, I stuck with two, I uh, mainly um, because I think that's sort of the recommended format for starters. So I was just like, I'll just go with the default, but we did recruit a lot of helpers. Mm. Um, so even if you don't have as many instructors, 
um, getting more helpers and they're like, yeah, I think we have like four helpers. Um, and so helpers are a really good way for people to sort of um, get involved, but without very much commitment to start mm -hmm. off with. Um, our instructors, um, I also, I've been part of a workshop where there are four instructors and each person did half a day. Um, by the, I think there's not quite enough work for four instructors. Um, so I like sort of just waited and waited, you know, like I helped out a little bit um, and then I taught like half a day and I was like, I don't know if that was worth my entire weekend. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so that was something that we considered. Um, I think, yeah, the number of instructors um, is worth a, a worthwhile like survey question as well. Yeah, I, I would love a survey on like your first self-organized workshop, you know, yes. what, did you, um, what did you charge, how many instructors did you have, like what's you know, mean, like, you know, would you recommend that? For someone else? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go back and cover a few tough things um, before we run out of time. It's almost uh, the end of the hour. So difficult situations, I think we've already covered some of this, so no shows. Um, it's always sort of a philosophical sort of walking the line of um, like how many no-shows are you going to accept, you know, sort of what makes sense. Um, for us, um, I've gotten to the habit again of sort of oversubscribing our space and then counting on people to not show up. Um, if you uh, do that, um, be careful. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, uh, for us, it has actually worked out pretty well. Um, for refunds, I haven't had to deal with this, and this is something they wanted me to cover, but I haven't had to deal with this. Um, we do keep a wait list um, of people, um, so I think at any given time, you know, some people will email and say, like, I can't make it anymore, I'm sorry about it. Um, in that case, it's really nice to have a, a wait list sort of on Eventbrite or something where you just say, hey, like, feel free to come if, if you want, um, and I've accepted people off the wait list as, as like, as soon as like a day before the event and they actually like some of them have shown up so um that's sort of a way to um balance that out um code of conduct violations this is sort of um requires maybe a, a deeper discussion than we have time for today um but i would the one thing i would recommend is um at least sitting down with your co-instructors and helpers once and sort of talking through you know what will happen like what is are the steps that we would take if this happened um i think just having that one conversation of you know we have a plan in case something you know code of conduct related happens um is really good um and you can incorporate it into your pre-workshop um, discussion um for us it turned out one of our instructors had actually been trained as a facilitator like as a mediator and so he brought his expertise about code of conduct um, to us and he was like yeah so like we're first going to give them a warning and then we'll do this um, and then you know if it doesn't work we'll um, ask them to leave. Um, this is generally not a huge problem um, but um, just having you know a preemptive at least five to ten minute discussion at the very minimum about what you would do in that case um, is something I would recommend. Um, accessibility challenges. Um, I think we've had one nursing mom go to one of our workshops. Um, and so for her, um, we made sure there was an extra room. Um, for that, I think just having your contact information available and double checking the space um, is really good. So people can contact the email on the website if they have uh, accessibility questions and so she reached out she's like hey like it would be really great if there's an extra room and I was like yeah definitely um and I'm thinking I haven't run into that many um like difficult situations but um those are like a few that I can think of off the top of my head um I guess the question for you all is um what else might happen in a workshop that requires prior discussion and maybe how can we preemptively address some of these challenges Hmm. Have a, I have a question that, that kind of worries me. I haven't encountered it yet, but um, people asking if they can sort of dip in and out of um, modules in the curriculum. 
Um, how do you handle that? Is it just a flat across the board? No, if you if you have to come to everything, if you're going to come at all, can't come to all of it, let someone take your spot kind of communication? Or how do you deal with that question? Right, it's sort of like the spotty attendance question. Yeah, that. If I can't make it for all of it, can I still come? Right. Um, I think if the person is... Uh, communicative. Um, for us, I've sort of taken a more sort of like liberal approach to it um, in that if someone has signed up for it and then, you know, emails me saying, you know, I have to leave for an hour and come back. Um, I've been like, okay, that's fine. It is, um, if you do have a really long wait list, um, it is something that I keep in mind um, that, you know, uh, Sometimes if someone says that they, they can only attend for a little bit, I'm like, okay, and then I maybe contact someone on the wait list. That's, mm -hmm. that's sort of, um, I, I think for, for us, um, the spotty attendance is okay. Our space is relatively easy to get in and out of um, to people. And I, and I think this is actually, people actually sometimes just leave after a while. Like, it's sort of strange. Um, like they, it's like 3 p.m. and they just like walk out and I'm like, where are you going? <laughs> Um, but it, maybe they found that, you know, they've gotten enough from the workshop or their, their brain is just so overloaded that um, <laughs> they need a break. Um, but I, I think uh, as long as it doesn't disrupt the other people in the room who are learning, um, I'm okay with it. Okay, um, I have one question. Um, how can you effectively um, carry along the novices and advanced learners to sustain their interest in teaching. Can you repeat that? Sorry, I missed a little bit of it. How can you help the novices mm -hmm. and the advanced learners in a workshop such that uh, you are able to successfully carry everyone along? So uh, are you asking sort of if there's a range of like skill level at your workshop? Yeah, the range of um, uh, learners, those that are novices and those that are advanced learners. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I was confused what you meant by offices. I was thinking like Microsoft Office. Um, yeah, so if you have, we in my workshops, actually, I've had a pretty big mix of people who are in the workforce and people who are in school. Um, and for us, um, the people who are, I think because I'm based at a university, and our primary focus is the students, um, uh, focusing on sort of that. And then, you know, the people in the workforce um, sort of are our second priority. So in terms of who we want to target, I think students really matter to us. Um, and then if people from the workforce come and they get something out of the workshop, it's actually really nice too. Um, I found that actually in organizing these workshops, having people in the workforce and students in the same room is, is sometimes nice because um, occasionally someone in the workforce can bring a data informed perspective that students don't necessarily have. Um, so they're like, yeah, like I've, I've worked with this type of data set before and whatever, whatever. Um, and then having that conversation between people. So for me, it's been a positive to have sort of diverse learners in the room because learners start having conversations between each other um, that I think um, benefit them. Um, if you don't really, if you want to restrict it, I think you can create an event right oh someone just made a chat let's see oh no evo uh sorry or ivo sorry um yeah so you can also restrict registration to people with dot ed addresses if you don't want to have that mix in there um or you can't you know if you're not allowed to serve people from the outside in that way thanks Okay, um, we're at time, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, say um, if you're interested in continuing to chat, um, the next few chats for this, I think we're going to focus a little bit more on like the technical infrastructure of organizing, are going to be Friday, August 23rd, um, same time, and then Tuesday, August 27th, the same time. Um, so you can sign up on the Etherpad. I'll throw in um, the like the sign up after this. Um, a request for you. Can I actually use a screenshot from this chat to report on a, the mentoring program showcase? Is that okay? Yeah. With folks? That's okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that because that, I guess that's part of this is that we, 
we have that. So let me stop sharing my screen for now. How do I do this? Pause, share, nope, uh, stop, share. Um, all learning experience here. All right, so I don't know if we want to, is there something that, I don't, do the carpentries have some sort of? <laughs> we have this at UT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'll just go ahead and, and uh, take a screenshot really quickly. Do, do whatever hand motion you want, like thumbs up or a smile or something. And <laughs> okay, and I'll, I'll get a photo here of everyone. Yay, okay. <laughs> okay, ready, one, two, three, ready? Okay. Okay, and then maybe I should. Okay, that's great. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, if you have questions regarding sort of organizing, um, you can find support on the mentoring channel in the Slack. Um, let me see if I can still share. Um, so, all right, so you can find um, support on the mentoring channel in the Carpentry Slack, um, and feel free to reach out um, that way. Um, and best of luck in, in your organizing. Um, it's not part of like the education, I think of like the instructor training, but it's a really valuable skill to have. So, um, put in the work and, and you got this with all the checklists. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Thank you all so much. All right. Um, take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.